Are you Hello. We have a full house tonight, which is wonderful. If I can get everyone to quiet down a little bit, I think we're going to get it started this evening. Thank you so very much for being with us this evening. Um, we are here to get to speak with our wonderful author, Peter Vanos, about his book, Hiding in Plain Sight, How a Jewish Girl Survived Europe's Heart of Darkness. And before I get started with all the introductions, I'll introduce myself, of course. And, and my name is Samantha Capicato. I am the director of New York programs and the director of global operations support at the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities. We are one of your co-organizers this evening. The Institute, as well as Cardoza Law School, uh, we have a partnership and a relationship with the Lenape Center here in New York City, as well as the greater Lenape people, uh, the original holders and keepers of the land that you're sitting on right now. And before every event or program that we run as institutions, we start those programs with our living land acknowledgement with the Lenape Center that we have. So I'm going to do that now. I'd like to begin by recognizing the original people of this land, the Lenape, as well as their deep connection to the Lenape Hope and Home Land. As an organization dedicated to atrocity prevention, the Auschwitz Institute and the Cardozo Law School believe in the deep importance of acknowledging the settler colonial genocide perpetrated against this community and the resilience of the Lenape, who still today continue to resist erasure. If anyone would like more information about our Living Land Acknowledgements, acknowledgements with the Lenape Center or Living Land Acknowledgements in general, please let us know. We're happy to speak about that with you this evening as well. Now I have the great pleasure of introducing all of the organizations and the wonderful people involved in the event that we're having here this evening. Um, first, I would like to introduce our sponsors for the event. Did I just do something here? That's right. Okay. <laughs> I'll step over here. <laughs> First, I'd like to introduce our sponsors for the event this evening, the Netherlands Club of New York City, which is represented here today uh, by Evelyn Honig. Do you want to say hello, Evelyn? Hi, nice to meet you all. Welcome to the Netherlands. I'm the executive director, as Catherine, but I've been in charge of the book club. And this is our first wonderful book. <laughs> Thank you so much, Evelyn. The Netherlands Club was actually founded here in New York City over 100 years ago in 1903. The club has a cultural focus, of course, on the Netherlands and serves as a hub for social, cultural, and professional activities for individuals with ties to the Netherlands here in New York City. The club organizes events and provides networking opportunities for its members and guests and is a home away from home for the Dutch in New York, as Peter can attest to. <laughs> A little bit about my organization. The Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities is an international nonprofit organization dedicated in building uh, a world that prevents genocide and mass atrocities. We do this through education, training, and technical assistance programs that we offer to state institutions around the world and, uh, and through providing those trainings for our government officials and stakeholders to strengthen and develop practices and policies for the prevention of genocide and other mass atrocities. We have offices, of course, here in New York City, as well as in Auschwitz in Poland, where Auschwitz is located, Bucharest, Romania, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Kampala, Uganda. To date, we have over 90 UN member states that are working with us on our programming and atrocity prevention, and have welcomed over 8,800 alumni to our programs and are working in our network around the world to prevent these most heinous crimes. Our other co-organizers and of course our gracious hosts this evening at the Cardozo Law School are the Cardozo Law Institute in Holocaust and Human Rights, as well as the Benjamin B. Ferenz Human Rights and Atrocity Prevention Clinic. Funded by a Holocaust Claim Settlement Award, the Institute aims to strengthen laws, norms, and institutions to prevent mass atrocities and strengthen human rights protection. Within the Institute, the Human Rights and Atrocity Prevention Clinic provides law students with hands-on legal training for the next generation of human rights advocates while offering students the opportunity to make a real difference in people's lives while they're still in law school. Now I'll turn, of course, to our incredible people up here in front with me. <laughs> Thank you. First, I have the pleasure of introducing you to, to Professor Jocelyn Geckenkastenbaum. 
Uh, Jocelyn is, of course, a law professor here at Cardozo, but she is also the director of both the Institute for Holocaust and Human Rights and the director of the Clinic for Human Rights and Atrocity Prevention, so she's not adverse to our work. Her, her scholarship focuses on human rights, public health, and atrocity prevention, with particular focuses on preventing and responding to sexual and gender <coughs> crimes, slavery and the slave trade, indigenous rights, and human rights violations against other minority groups. We are so honored to have her up here. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. And finally, I have the great pleasure of introducing our guest of honor this evening, author Peter Van Oost. Peter writes for NRC Handelsblad newspaper and Agrona Amsterdam magazine, both widely respected publications in the Netherlands. His published books, in addition to Hiding in Plain Sight, includes the Netherlands in Focus, and We Understand Each Other Perfectly, all about his years as a parliamentary journalist. In 2020, Peter was awarded the prestigious Libris History Prize, as well as the Bruce Prize for the Best Dutch Language Journalistic Book of the Year, with Hiding in Plain Sight. As we are all following and deeply impacted by the crises unfolding around the world today in Ukraine, in Israel, and in Gaza, stories of survivors of atrocities become ever more essential to providing us with opportunities to access our human capacity for empathy and for connection. They also help us to strengthen our own personal commitments to playing a role in the prevention of these crimes. So with that, it's an absolute honor, Peter, to welcome you here tonight. Thank you so very much for being with us. And Jocelyn, I'll turn it over to you. So Peter, welcome. Thank and you. Welcome Thank to you. everyone. And I'm so glad that everyone could come out this evening to hear a little more about this book. I hope that everyone will be inspired to read this book, to take it home, because it is such an incredible story and an incredible storytelling, I would say. So I first wanted to thank you for writing this book. You're very welcome. <laughs> it's, it's incredibly rich. It's, it's full of insight into the human capacity to love, to hate, genocidal violence. You discuss it really intimately throughout the, the book of perpetration, of survival, and difficult questions that remain when you look closely really at the complexity of identity, ideology, conflict. So I wanted to hear more about why you chose to write this book. Yeah, it's uh, always, always difficult to say in just a few lines, so I, I permit myself to <laughs> dwell on this a bit. First of all, I'm very honored to be here. I never expected to uh, write a book that would be translated in English. That's better than any prize you can get. <laughs> and then even be in New York and uh, sit here in front of an audience. Audience, if, if people came in too late, there are still chairs in front. So if you're like, if you don't want to stand, you can come up front. If you want to stand, that's uh, fine, of course. Um, uh, so I'm very honored, thanks. And now why I wrote the book, there are, of course, always very profane uh, reasons that I normally don't mention, like uh, I followed my wife abroad, which is actually also one of the reasons. Uh, we lived suddenly in Poland. I'd never been in Poland before that. I've been to America uh, quite, a, quite some, uh, a few times, uh, more than, uh, actually more than a few times, but never been to Poland, even though it's not that far from Holland. Uh, so I had all kinds of plans. Uh, and first of them was uh, a colleague of mine at the newspaper said, oh, you're going to Poland. Are you going to be the correspondent concentration camps? And that sounded so awful that I said, no, not at all. Uh, why would you say that? And then I, I had the opposite plan. I would write about, uh, the, the, I already had a title of a book called Poland in Color, because we have images of Poland, or at least let's talk for myself. I had images in Poland in my head that were always black and white. They were either about communism, either about the Second World War, and you had these black and white images. So I thought, I'm going to write about fun in Poland. And I did actually, I will not tell you all the articles I wrote, but in the beginning I found fun subjects in Poland, uh, little villages of, oh, no, I, I promise not to tell those, sorry. Oh, one little village where they spoke Dutch, or where they still speak Dutch. Okay, okay. So I, I found fun subjects, but I also realized after a while that it was very artificial and a bit forced, because I reckon that Poland maybe is not a very colorful country. And that the most exotic part of Poland, or the most fascinating part, is its history. 
and everybody in Poland walks with history. In New York, people do the same. I know there's a lot of history in New York too, but as a Dutchman, I never uh, experienced so much um, history, almost too much history. Poles are also obsessed by history, also politically, as we all know. Uh, it, uh, history is used as a political tool anywhere in the world, but in Poland especially. So I started thinking out that, no, I, 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 I should ask about this and work about this. And then I came to realize that, the, to say it a bit complicated, but the, 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 yeah, the, the, the presence of the absence of the Jewish community is enormous. So even though that was not where I was aiming for, I'm not from a Jewish family, I didn't have this idea of I go to Poland and now I can finally figure out how, I didn't have all, all that. But Warsaw is such a strange city because the, uh, the Jewish community has been so big and influential and important that it's so awkward to be there uh, while it's all gone, right? So I, I befriended a, a guy from Israel who works at the Jewish Historical Institute. And he is only in Poland to revive the Polish tango. It's not in his book, the Polish tango, don't worry. It's a very awkward thing. He always tried to explain it. It's not Jewish, it was just Jewish people playing the Polish tango. It's anyhow. So, uh, and then I started to realize there is a world, uh, there was a world before 43, 42, uh, that is really interesting. And then I got into that, etc. And then I thought, okay, I have to find a story in which I can put all my new obsessions, because it was all new. And I always kept to the rule that if something was new for me when I arrived in Poland, it's interesting enough for my reader. That's maybe why the book got so thick. I mean, it's very small letters, but it's actually quite a lot of letters, a lot of words. Um, and then I started to look for a story. I've, and I wrote a few, actually quite a few biographical stories of Poles, of Jewish Poles, of Polish Jews. Uh, and, um, and then I found a man from my youth, from when I was young, a friend I lost, uh, we lost contact, that's the English, right? Out of sight, he was outside. And suddenly he was sitting behind a piano uh, in Warsaw. And we got to chat, etc. And he said, well, I'm one, he's called Amir Swap. And he's the grandson of the lady the book is about. But he was there to visit, the, to find the grave in the big Jewish cemetery of Warsaw of his great grandmother. So I had time enough on my hands. <laughs> I was there with my wife, right? So uh, I had to write for the newspaper, but not on a daily basis. So I joined him. And while searching for this grave, it took quite a while, uh, he told me the story of his grandmother, who was born in 26, probably in 26, we're not all too sure. Um, she's not so sure herself, because she always used the birthday of the fake baptized certificate she got in 40 one probably, um, but she was probably from 26, came from a Hasidic family in Warsaw. And the story was so, I found it so fascinating. Um, at that time, especially because of the Zelik kind of uh, um, qualities to it. Zelik, this movie by Woody Allen of a person who has chameleontic talents. And well, this is Woody Allen, so it's a bit grotesque. Uh, it's a person who becomes his the people he's around with. So when he's with Native Americans, he even becomes a bit rat in his face. And it ends, uh, well, it's, it's a strange movie. I'm not gonna tell you the movie, but my main, this grandpa had this chameleontic talent. So she could be a Pole among the Poles, a Catholic Pole among the Catholic Poles. There was also more prosaic reasons for that there in the book, we'll not explain them now. But later on, she even became German with the Germans. So they saw her and a Nazi family took her in she loved this family. Uh, she still, oh, well, she now she passed away. But when she was telling me all these stories, she was still very fond of this family. And you're preempting uh, my next question. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, that's right. so, so I found it was such an amazing story that I thought, okay, this is the story I'm going to pursue. Okay. Well, let me ask the next question because you're going there anyway. So you tell the survival story of Mala Kaisal. Kaisal? Uh, yeah, Kiesel. Yeah, Kiesel? Um, Mala Rivka Kiesel, yes. Okay, I read the book, but I was reading the book, so I had to make up my own Americanized, of course, terrible of course. Uh, oh. translation. A Jewish girl from a large Hasidic family in Warsaw. And in many ways, Mala represents the typical young Jewish girl growing up in an Orthodox Jewish family in Europe during the World War, the Second World War. And in other ways, she's absolutely extraordinary. And her specific characteristics, the things that make her her, 
also tell the story of how she can navigate and get through this dangerous context while hiding yeah. in plain sight, as you call the book. So I'm wondering if you can tell us more about her and your understanding of her survival and her resilience yeah. as she makes her way through. Yeah, yeah. resilience, of course, uh, absolutely the word that is applicable to her. Um, so her story, for me, it was also important to see what the story, how the story would bring history to life, that wherever she was, uh, history happened. History happens everywhere. That's empty English, I know, but she's a bit like a Forrest Gump. I didn't mention that because Forrest Gump, of course, is mentally maybe not comparable to my main uh, character, but she was in Warsaw when the ghetto was from. First, she was in this Jewish neighborhood in Warsaw. This is a uh, in his Hasidic family, and she could talk about it very lively. Um, also in a very, not only in a nostalgic way, and so um, later on, yeah, it's not only in a nostalgic way, that's maybe interesting to say. So, so this, for example, the position of little girls was not to her liking, to say it that way. Um, then she uh, is in the ghetto. This is the largest ghetto the Germans uh, built, built as formed in um, uh, the Second World War. Uh, she became one of the smugglers. Uh, so one of the young kids who found ways to get out and in. Um, she was not the only one, eh? but, but it still is quite spectacular uh, how she did it, how she talked about it, etc. Then, when it was almost, what is the horrible word always used about this, the, the ghetto was executed, the ghetto was liquidated, liquidated things. Um, she, just before that, she fled to the countryside. And when the Germans came to the countryside, this is in Western Ukraine, current Ukraine, at that time occupied Poland, general government, um, in a small town, a very small village, sorry, called Karpi. It's difficult to find it. We'll see it on the pictures, uh, at least a little bit. Um, so when the Germans, and this is a term they coined themselves, went on Judenjagd, a Judenjagd, that is the hunt for Jews, um, that's a year later. That was when she was there. So again, Forrest Gump, she's there when that happens. So she runs into the forest. Many Jewish refugees did that. Very Jewish people in Poland tried to survive that way. Um, but then she did something that saved her. Um, she um, volunteered to go to Germany to work, of course, with a false identity, with saying she was a Catholic Pole. And she could convincingly do this because she went to a school where there were also Catholic Polish classes. There were Jewish classes, but the Polish classes. Mm -hmm. This was a multicultural experiment in the Jewish neighborhood. She went there without the knowledge of her father, who would not have allowed this. For me, it's unimaginable. It took me a long time. I can go to a school every day without your father knowing this. Mm -hmm. But um, in the book, I hope to, I, that I can, can convincingly explain how that worked. It had to do with the relationship between fathers and daughters. And, a very big, large family where <coughs> the sons weren't allowed to look at the girls, but also the daughters were in their own world, uh, in a way, and her older sisters made sure she could go to the school. Then the Jewish section of the school was full, so she ended up in the, on the Catholic side. That was tough for her because there she was being uh, bullied. And when it was break time, she was thrown stones at her by the Jewish kids in school. Because she was in the Catholic part. Well, okay, that's all in the book. I shouldn't explain the word. That's not your question. The Forrest Gump part is that, yes, she ended up there uh, in this uh, rural area, running through the forest. She went to Germany. Then when the war finally came to Germany, she was there too. Uh, in the middle of bombardments, uh, I won't explain you the whole story, but it, she ends up uh, not with this Polish girls anymore, where she was forced laborer with the Polish girls, but she ends up with a Nazi family, um, thinking that she's ethnic German, she claiming she is. Why? This I can tell, right? I mean, I should be careful not to say too much, but because a Ukrainian man has heard her talk Yiddish in her sleep. So she was very, she was a chameleontic person. She was very good at uh, posing, right? Lying, you could say, to survive. Um, but she couldn't control what she said in her sleep. So in the morning, this Ukrainian boy, man, boy, in his 20s, looked at her, she then being 16, 17 at that time, saying, you're a Jew. 
and I'm going to rat you out. I'm going to the Germans and tell, uh, this is the end of you. Um, so she was, of course, completely confused. Et cetera, et cetera. Then they put her in kind of like a prison, and I found this in the administration. I couldn't find many things in Poland because Poland is bloodlands, right? It's so much things are just gone, completely gone. In Germany, you can still find a lot of things. You could find the administration of the prison. Uh, this was not really a prison. It was like a forced laborer thing, but with guards and you know, couldn't escape. And they would, uh, the, 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 she was told they would investigate if he was right, saying she was Jewish, or she was right, saying, of course I'm not Jewish. Well, what are you talking about? And why do you listen to a Ukrainian? You know, maybe I'm not Untermensch as a Pole, but this guy's Ukrainian. I don't know exactly why would you believe him? He just tried to hit on me. But she surely had a good story. So she had a good story. The guy tried to hit on her. Um, and now she was blaming, uh, was, was saying she was Jewish just because she didn't want him. And the Germans would investigate this. And I won't explain how exactly, but they believed her, they didn't believe him. So she came out again. And then when she came out, they had a little interview with her. And then she gave all false names of fathers, her mother, the maiden name of her grandma, her father on her mother's side, which was a German name, Wassermann. But she knew it could also be Jewish. So she, she always found, tried to find these things that she would feel still a bit comfortable with the lie. Um, so they asked her, so are you maybe Volksdeutsch, like ethnic German? So yes, of course, why didn't you ask me before? And they believed her. So from that moment on, also having a great talent for languages, I mean, it's not just only, yeah, it's a lot of things altogether, why it's this yeah. yeah. And now I completely forgot which question was. Sorry, but this is, <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> I, 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 I thought it was such an ordinary, such an extraordinary story. I thought, okay, I should pursue this. I should, and then I find out that the book was already written by her, well, actually by a Polish friend in Holland, but it was one of the very interesting uh, witness accounts, right? It was a survival story. But I thought, okay, I can, what can I do as a journalist? I can try to find the places where she was and try to verify the stories she told me and see also what can you still find in the present of a story that's 70, 80 years old. And that's complicated. Well, that, and the book is part about that, about researching a story like this. And what, what can you still But you find? still go on this roller coaster of, Thank you, for you know she will survive because it's a story of survival, but at every turn, there's this possibility that she will be found out. Yeah. And you, you go through that, uh, that journey throughout the book. Um, I wanted to ask about the beginning of the book because I found it to be jarring, to be honest. Yeah. And I understand from the perspective of atrocity prevention and thinking about these issues more deeply and structurally, why you begin the story, but I'd love for you to explain yeah. why you start of the story of the, the Jews who, having survived the Germans, are then later killed by Poles after liberation. Yeah. Tell yeah. us, tell us about yeah. the beginning. And, and this, I, I, I had some discussions about this, of course, because if you will start a book, well, I have friends who honestly told me, it's like, yes, you're a friend of mine. I started the book. It's too heavy. I put this away. And it's all because of this first chapter. And they all said, what is that to do with the lady? What, what is well, not much. And still, it has a lot with her story. And it's also a bit of a warning. It's like, this is not going to be pleasant. It's not a pleasant survival story. Uh, and so the subtitle in English, in Dutch, it's all titled very differently. Also, the hiding plain sight is different. It's like rather uh, animal than human, which is the title of a poem she still knew by heart when she was 93 years old. Um, the subtitle is How a Jewish Girl Survived, uh, Survived Europe's Heart of Darkness. And the heart of darkness part is in the beginning. Well, it's everywhere in the book, but I try to warn people a little bit. And it also had to do, of course, I didn't know people would really read this book. I read, I wrote story, uh, books before. People didn't read them. So, <laughs> yes, I have that experience uh, yeah. too. <laughs> so I, I wasn't really, uh, you know, uh, oh, my English, I wasn't uh, expecting this or I wasn't. Uh, Reckoning, there's another word for this, but anyhow. Um, so it was also like a warning. And at that moment, when I was writing this, there was a very popular book in Holland. It's called Humankind. In English, it's called Humankind. In Dutch, it's something like most people do the right thing. 
Um, and I disagree. Uh, and of course, I think we're all capable of doing the right thing and the good thing. And I'm very happy that there's also love in the book and that she experiences love. Um, when people don't realize that she is from another self-perceived group, and that these Nazis she's in, who are, as she says, sick of Hitler, they are so in love with Hitler that they're sick of him. Uh, that's her, in Dutch that makes sense, in English I hear it sounds like the opposite. But um, uh, that uh, the people, uh, that the whole, the more structural thinking about genocide and atrocity, as you do in your work, of course, I didn't do that, I'm just a journalist. But I thought I can show in a story where I stand, or where this book stands. And it's not with the banality of evil, uh, where we think that every human being is a schreibtisch murderer, it's like a murderer behind his desk. Um, it's just a banal uh, human being who does horrible things without really acknowledging it. No, in the Second World War, when the circumstances are in a, in a certain way, when conditions are, to say, right, but I mean the opposite, when the conditions are horrible, right? Um, many people are capable, apparently, to do atrocious things that they are not really asked, then it's not asked of them. So in this example, these Polish uh, resistant fighters, they had absolutely no reason to kill them. They just were looking for gold and thought Jews have gold. That was like in their minds. Um, these people didn't have gold. And if they had it, they already gave it to the person that hit them, a farmer. They were beneath a pig steel. You said pig steel? Pig sty. Pig sty. Thanks, pig sty. The words pig steel. Pig So uh, this, uh, um, so I just wanted to, uh, and these people <coughs> killed uh, the Jews who survived, these Polish Jews who survived from a community where nobody survived. There's a little village in the east of Poland that sort of, almost nobody survived. Um, and I'm not going to tell the whole story, you can read it, but it just shows you that in certain conditions, we, it, uh, we have it all in us. We have the love and the good in us, but I also struggle every day with my own weaknesses, with uh, a lack of... Uh, uh, to be brave or a lack of courage or of egocentrical uh, things or uh, I'm not an altruist uh, every moment of the day uh, <laughs> interested in everybody's stories as I try to be uh, um, and I think the first story shows that that this bad is in all of us and it can come out in very unexpected uh, ways um, so there was also a bit to show where I am and where the book is at. But it's, I admit, it's quite tough. And oh yeah, can, maybe I can add one more thing. About it. There was uh, somebody wrote a review and, um, okay, of course, nobody read my books. So I asked a very famous Dutch writer called Geert Mack uh, to write a blurb. It's not on here because nobody knows Geert Mack in America. But in Holland, <laughs> Geert Mack is very important. And he uh, wrote back something. And I, very soon, I sent them the manuscript, and in two days, something like, like suspiciously soon, this is gossip. Anyhow, he wrote to me, "Does this work?" Double points. Um, I couldn't put this book away. It's like a, it's like one heartbeat book, you know. It's like unputdownable, unputdownable. That would be the word. So I'm very, thank you very, very much. So we put it on the book, and then one reviewer said, "The book is about somebody who lies." It was a very good liar, and that's why she survived. But the biggest lie is on the cover of the book, <laughs> because it's not possible to read this book at once, like in one go. Um, and Geert Mack, I know Geert Mack, that's what the reviewer said, as a man with a heart. So either he has no heart, or he's lying. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so uh, we still don't know exactly. I don't dare to ask him, but I'm very happy that he gave me that quote. But yeah, uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough read. For in many it's a aspects. tough read. It's a very compelling read. Thank you. Thank I think you, you could you. read it in one sitting if you didn't need to put it down. Yeah. <laughs> because it is so difficult, some of the, yeah. the subjects. But and then you're a professor in genocide and studies, I, so I, you, you can handle. I mean, but I'm you, also in it for the long run. Yeah. And so I need to take yeah. care, and I know when I need to take care because of what I see and what I do. What you read, yeah. yeah. But this book, so the other extraordinary part of the book is that you actually were able to speak with Mala yeah. on numerous occasions yeah. and really get to know her. Yeah. And I thought it would be nice if you could bring her to life a little yeah. tonight for us and 
talk maybe about her as a human being, yeah. especially in her later years. Yeah. There's not a lot about her later years no. in the book, so yeah, tell us a little bit about her. I'll, I'll show, uh, this is the, these are the two, uh, this is a Nazi uh, couple that took oh, her in, yeah. but this is not important now. This is her, this is the oldest picture she has of herself, and it's probably made in 46 or 47, she doesn't know herself, but in Wroclaw, when she is marrying an Auschwitz survivor that she meets in Wuch after the war, she didn't feel very comfortable coming back to Poland. She wanted to go back to Poland to find her family, of course. So she leaves this Nazi family. Um, a, a, a Red Army soldier takes her bike, the bike that she got on her birthday. Was the, in Germany, it was the first time in her life her birthday was being celebrated by these Nazis, and they gave her a wonderful bike. And the Red Army soldier takes the bike away, and she trades it for a horse. So she, <laughs> she passes the new border with Poland on a horse. And, and then she gets to Warsaw, and the neighborhoods where she's from is completely eradicated. Right? The Warsaw ghetto, is, as you know, after the revolt of the ghetto, I think I have the feeling I don't have to tell this to you. You know this probably better than I do. But it was completely eradicated. There was even a concentration camp built on top of the ruins to sort the ruin out. So um, there was nothing there. Oh, you can see it on the cover of the book. That is. That was what the ghetto was in 1941, and this is a picture taken from 46, um, from a girl uh, with a girl almost the age she had when she came back. So she couldn't find anybody, and she remembers this like strong line that she asked after sitting there and realizing everything is gone. She asked somebody who was also clearly looking for where this house was, saying, "Are there still Jews?" Uh, are there still Jews? Uh, it's an odd question. But that was a question she posed this man. And I said, oh, yes, you should go to Wuch. And she went to Wuch, and there she met her husband. And, but she felt awkward because she looked good, right? She had a fur coat, and she had all thermometers with her. She got it from the Nazi family. The hunger arrived in Germany right after the war, 46, 47. Um, and then she met there in this place. Well, first, the concierge, is that English, the doorman, mm -hmm asked her, so what do you, like a Polish uh, uh, lump, like, no, no, like a tough talking guy, mm -hmm. a bit harsh, saying, what do you have to do with Jews? Was the line he was, as she remembered that. He says, well, I'm one of them, and I hope that I can stay here. Uh, okay, but she was so, she was the odd one out, because she didn't look as uh, my protagonist in the book, Mala, told me, as a old, I get to that, uh, she said, they all look like skeletons. So she felt very, she felt a bit guilty and awkward. Uh, how do I explain this? That I'm one of them, but I look like I do. And then, as you see, she had blue eyes. It's quite important for a chameleon to survive at that time. So um, blonde hair and blue eyes. You can see it even as a black and white picture. And this is her when the book was launched in... <laughs> it's, a, it's always quite emotional. <laughs> and she was a very tough... Uh, hard speaking, uh, tough speaking lady. She passed away two years after the book came out. It was fascinating at this book lounge. She was still completely um, sharp. Uh, not completely, she was sharp, but she kind of like lost interest in doing intellectual uh, activity. So I remember that. Uh, she was there and suddenly she asked me, so why are all these people here? So yeah, because the book is out, you know, the book about you. Which book? The book I, I wrote. Ah, my book. Yes, your, your book. <laughs> and um, somebody asked her, and then we decided that we both would sign, right? So she signed, I signed it was her book. And then somebody asked her, so did you already read it? I said, no, 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 I know the story. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so she was a, a lady like that. That's a bit what you want to hear. Yeah, yeah. And in my conversations with her, I always thought that she was very tough. Uh, that didn't. That, that was not. That she was not very emotional, telling the story. But then later on, I heard from her daughter that her daughter was in the sixties then, and now in her seventies, uh, was dreading the the moments I would come because she would be uh, completely. Not that, how you say that, like uh, exhausted, yeah, yeah, friends, and, and exhausted afterwards. So it would take them that I don't know if it's true, but the daughter of uh, uh, Mala or Mrs. Slaffer for me 
uh, would tell me that it takes us two days to uh, get her back on her feet. So don't come, don't come too often. That was basically <laughs> what they tried to tell me. And it was fine because it, I did understand that I was coming too often in the end because she thought, why should I repeat myself? She had this one story and this is the working of memory, right? She, she had this one story in her mind. She could tell it very fluently. But after a while, when I was trying to find things, I wanted to know other things. So like when you were in Tomasz of Lubelski, were there like hills around you? Was there a train? Because uh, it wasn't really sure where she was. For her, it was sure, but she was never, it never came back to Poland after she left. She left after the pogrom of Kielce. So, um, so she left and she never came back. So for her, it was clear, it was Tomasz of Lubelski. But the people I talked to in Poland said, it cannot be this place. It's different from everything she says. So I came back with very trivial questions in her eyes um, and saying, ah, you know that already with this very thick Dutch Yiddish accent, wonderful accent. <laughs> Say, you know all this stuff. I told you that. Why should I repeat that? And then she would start to tell the same story. And I wanted to hear something else. So that in the end, the meetings were also a bit, uh, and then I would stop her and say, no, 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 no. I just want to know if there's some hills around or uh, no, no, no. I, I, it's a, quite a while ago. but. Um, so I don't really know the examples anymore, but I asked her like very specific things and she couldn't answer that. And I remember once I got a bit annoyed even, I mean, we were only there, there was nobody else. So, you know, you, I permitted myself to become a bit annoyed. Uh, I, I feel ashamed now for it, but okay. And then um, I asked her what's on my list was, you told me that you were uh, always, when you were insecure, if the Polish girls, the Polish Catholic girls, they were all illiterate and she was on the train with them to uh, Germany and then she worked with them in a the factory before she became ethnic German right she was full with the Polish girls and they were always like she was a city girl so um, sometimes she was afraid they find out I'm Jewish um, and when she was insecure she would like re recite poems she knew by heart that she learned in his Polish school and so I asked her do you still know one of those poems I said of course I do that was a bit astonishing because she couldn't tell me if there were hills around Tomasz of Lubelski or there was a train or was a very simple question she couldn't answer. So, uh, okay, could you? Uh, of course. And then she came with this poem in Polish fluently. I, I, turned, I had my iPhone on. It felt like uh, half an hour. In the end, it was 14 minutes. I know because of the tape. But because my Polish is not uh, like some Polish for some of you, maybe, uh, I didn't understand the word. And, but it was impressive. And then I uh, asked a Polish friend to listen to the poem. And he was amazed by it too. We looked it up on the internet. We found one version of it. And it was only different in, on three uh, words. And we don't know if the one on the internet is the original one or hers is the original one. We're not so sure. So it was really impressive. And the title of that poem is the title of the Dutch book. In English it sounds a bit odd, but it's like a rather being an animal than a human, uh, or rather not human, you could say, uh, which was, of course, quite odd that that was a poem she recited at that time, the moment her, her whole family was murdered. So uh, very, very awkward. Uh, so putting back your investigator, yeah. your investigative journalist hat, yeah. talk to us about any facts or findings that you found particularly yeah. shocking when you dug into Mala's story. Yeah. There were, of course, for me in the beginning, the, the gruesome parts were the most shocking. In Holland, we still talk about the Second World War, but in terms of cruelty and gruesomeness, it is really nothing compared to what happened in Eastern Europe, um, in this part of Europe. They call it Central Europe, I call it Eastern Europe, I don't know what you want to call it, but like the bloodlands as Timothy Snyder uh, calls them, right? Uh, and I want to show you one picture of these two people these are Ukrainians in Karpi. The guy there was just, just before the picture was taken, he was very happy that Karpi was on the GPS. He asked him, are we really on the GPS? And yes, Karpi is on the GPS. And he told his neighbor, we exist. We are on his phone. You know? <laughs> and uh, there's just a few houses. And this is where uh, the protagonist of the book Mala uh, hid for quite a few months, but didn't hit like under a big sty, a big sty. But, uh, they were so far out in the boondocks where not nothing was at that Jewish refugees could just walk around there. She stayed with her family, Gemitro, and she would um, 
take their <coughs> cows. They had two cows, take them to a field and bring them back in the end of the day. So she was part of the household and they were happy with her because she read the Bible to them and the whole village was illiterate and they were Christians. So they were very happy that this young girl, this young Jewish girl could read the Bible. And she told me in one of the sessions I just talked to you, uh, told you about, ah, these were lovely people. The Mitruks were so lovely. And the great thing was they were too primitive to be anti-Semites. And I thought that was a very strange line. In my upbringing, I always thought, you know, the more, the more educated you are, the more tolerant you are. And uh, less educated people are uh, less tolerant. Sorry, my English is not very broad. It's just a few words. So in Dutch, it sounds much better. Okay, anyhow. But um, uh, so I just thought that's just some of the strange things 80 years old, 87 year old say, right? I just put it in that box and I didn't use it for a while, for a long time. But when I tried to understand this town, this Carpi, which was in the middle of the bloodlands, and these people are. Uh, descendants of Ukrainians who lived on the other side of the current border. So they were sent in the Aksion Vistula. This is in 47. This is after the war when uh, Soviet Stalin, Soviet Union and the new Polish communist government agreed on an ethnic cleansing policy or more ethnic relocation. Cleansing is that's too rough of a word. Sorry, uh, ethnic relocation. And it's something that's still quite popular in Poland. Actually, this is not Oh, it's off, right? It doesn't matter. I, I'm loud enough? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's still something that Poles don't really... Um, they say, well, the communists were horrible people on all kinds of reasons, but the ethnic relocation policy was okay. It meant that uh, Ukrainians in current Poland would go to uh, Soviet Republic Ukraine, that the Poles in Ukraine would be sent to Poland. And in '43, there was a genocidal... Uh, occurrence. So the Ukrainian nationalistic fighters, the, yeah, you would call the resistant fighters, the nationalists, um, decided to kill as many Poles as they could before the Red Army would arrive. And it's a bit uh, ironical to talk about it now, because as we all, as, at least I do, uh, support the Ukrainians and hope the Russians will lose this war. The, the heroes of Ukrainian nationalism are the same people that are by Poles regarded as war criminals. Uh, and both are right, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Jews were always, well, the, the, don't make it too complicated. <laughs> so this village, these people, uh, I couldn't find any of the people who took care of Mala because they were either killed by these Ukrainian nationalists, if they were Polish, it's very, we were not so sure. And so, uh, or, um, uh, they, yeah, I, they, yeah, because the, the village was empty, so there were probably Poles who were killed, or they were deported, right? They were deported to Poland after the war. So none of them were descendants of the Gmit troops. None of them could tell me about his family, which I found disturbing, of course, and uh, pity for the book. But now to my big discovery, well, I found a discovery, uh, and maybe says something about me, and it made that the lady. I wrote a book about uh, Mrs. Slaver, Mala, was maybe right in saying they were too primitive to be anti-Semites. Because in this region, it's a very large region, the current Western Ukraine, people didn't identify so much with a nationality at that time yet. At least in 1931, there was a Polish census, because it was all the Republic of Poland, and civil servants came to all houses. It was a huge <laughs> operation. Uh, a census at that time was a huge operation. And they asked them, what are you? <clears throat> they could choose from a list. You can even find it on the internet. It's not like deep journalism. This is not deep investigative journalism. It was a big, big discovery for me. And you could say, I'm a Lemko. Uh, that was a nationality at that time. I'm a Ukrainian. I'm a Belarusian. I'm a Russian. I'm a Pole. I'm a Jew. Jewish was regarded as a nationality, also by the Jewish community. Uh, um, nowadays, Poland still, which is a bit disturbing. Anyhow. Um, so they, um, uh, at that, at that area, there were a lot of people say, I'm none of the above. I'm just from here. Sometimes they would say I'm from Lubomirsky because they were serfs before they were in ser living in servitude, right? They, uh, and the family Lubomirsky was the biggest family of the area. So they worked for him, but that was, that was like 
80 years before that. Uh, serfdom was abolished uh, uh, many decades before, but nothing happened in that area, right? People were self-sufficient. They lived with their cows. And, and for Mala, the poverty was enormous. She had never seen that. And, and believe me, the Jewish community in Warsaw, where she was from, was a very poor uh, community. Many lived on uh, uh, charity coming from America, from Jewish uh, people in America. Um, so to, for her to be so astounded, astonished, meant it was really, really poor. They were eating from, they didn't have plates or spoons or knives. And she could talk about it for a long time. Like, I, I get the picture, I get the picture. <laughs> it's not, she could talk about it. But as she said, uh, again, there were two primitive to be and Semites. And that could be true because they didn't care about nationalities. They didn't really know what that was. They didn't care about different religions. They just knew there was a Bible and they couldn't read it. Uh, that was basically what they knew. Um, so maybe she wasn't so, uh, so wrong. So this from hero, so the, the Polish civil servants decided to make a new cat uh, category. They abolished the cat uh, cat uh, category, thank you, a bit later. But they had it in that census, and it's called two thesis. And uh, trans that's a Polish word translated like from heroes, people from here, or locals, but like real locals that had no affiliation with any nationality whatsoever. And for me, that was a big discovery. And why? And then they stopped because it also could give you hope. Because in some way, racism is not always something that's ingrained in people, it's also something that you have to be taught. If somebody teaches you when you're young that if you are a homophobic person, that somebody had taught you that homosexuals are dirty people, to say something, or that um, Germans are uh, horrible by nature. Somebody tells you that, right? Um, maybe it's not in us uh, naturally. And that is such a more consoling theory than the other way around, that you need a lot of education to become tolerant. But no, maybe there's also education involved in becoming intrinsic and fundamentalist extremist. Well, uh, I worked with the late great Ben Ferenz, who prosecuted the largest murder trial yeah. in human history. And he said that in that trial, he chose people on the basis of their rank and how many PhDs or how many letters were after their name. Yeah. So Be yeah, because education is not necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and his main right. man, Uldorf, or Uld, the main, uh, yeah, was a very educated PhD mm -hmm. uh, war criminal, right? Uh, yeah, so I'm yeah. going to ask you a question. I'm going to go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> In the end of the book, you include a chapter on Israel. Yeah. Why? Yeah, this is, again, the Forrest Gump aspect of the book. It, it was, I, I hesitated about this for a while, but she told me, of course, what happened after they fled Poland. Fleeing is a good word, because they went with a whole kibbutz. They built this kibbutz, uh, and you probably all know more about it in the book, are the, 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 the word, the names. Uh, which organization, etc. They went. They fled the country. Um, they were robbed at the border by Polish border patrols. Um, so these are typical stories, but for me they were all new. Right. So they are in the book, and then she went to Germany, and she was in Germany for quite a while. Um, ironically, uh, Jews in Europe were most safe at that time in the Tater uh, London, in Germany and Austria, in the American zone especially. Um, so, and then they relocate to Israel because her husband didn't want to go anywhere else anymore after what he experienced in the Second World War. It was the only option. She wanted to go to America, but she lost. And they went to Israel. And when they arrived in Israel, they were first in one of those camps, you know, internment places. Um, and then they were given an apartment in that one little town called Lot nowadays, called Lida, uh, before the Independence War of which even Zionist historians, that's why I dared to go there, um, say that if the Israeli armed forces <coughs> committed crimes in the independence war, or the Nakba, depends on what side you were on, right? That's where you stand on the, in the conflict. It was in Lida, where uh, tens of thousands of people were forced to flee in a very short time, in a very hot afternoon, um, just before the protagonist of my book arrived. And in some way, it shows you that this, the policy of uh, ethnic relocation is, that way, um, is everywhere, or everywhere you dare to look. Right? 
and I thought that it's important for the book that, or it would be a big mistake to leave that out, that I always describe what happened on the places where she was. Also, if she was not involved, right? What happened there? What happened in this place, Zerbst, Zerbst in Germany, where she was at when the Americans arrived? Um, uh, and I, I tell in great depth about what happened here in Ukraine and the uh, ethnic relocation. So I should also mention what happened in Israel at that little town where she arrived. Uh, and I hope I did it in a way that in Holland, I, I, the motto of that chapter is, I think, uh, you know, I, I can look it up, right? Because it's all a bit of time ago, so I don't dare to do it by head. But it's something like, if you want to keep some friends, don't write about Israel. <laughs> if you want to be loved by everyone. Thank you. If you want everyone to love you, don't discuss Israeli politics. I have the tendency to uh, want to be loved. <laughs> So I knew this is dangerous, this chapter, but, um, and especially the daughter of the main character was raised in Israel because the main character of the book comes to Holland only in the 60s, the end of the 60s. And she did find it a bit complicated and she let many Israeli friends of her read it. And then in the end she was convinced herself that yes, you should make this part of the book. <clears throat> So I don't think it's worded uh, in a complicated way. No, but yeah. I learned so much. Uh, that's good to hear. I learned yeah. so much by reading this book. So, but I'm, please uh, write to me afterwards. Uh, if you read the chapter on Israel and you think differently, tell me what you uh, think. Well, I'm going to now turn our attention to the audience and allow members of the audience to ask questions. So I put it on the and I think that there may be a mic coming around. So please just yeah. raise your hand yeah. and Luna will come. Let me see if they miss anything. She still died. Oh no. It's, it's okay if it's dying because this mic will pick up everybody's stuff. Okay. So it's okay. <laughs> also, yeah, while well, you're still thinking about the question, I know I say, did I miss something? I had like four words written down. There's only one thing. Yeah, this Israel chapter is just like the rest of the book, very much about the obsession with, uh, and, and uh, well, that we, we all live with nationality, race, identity, um, and, that, and it's everywhere. So it's not like, oh yeah, this is about Eastern Europe where they're all crazy or something. Hello. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but if, if you can stand and just say your name. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm Lexi. Yeah. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but I was wondering, did she ever tell the Nazi family that she was Jewish? Very good question. Yeah, it's uh, it's such a long time ago that I published it that I forget what I like, like the points that you really want to know. And this was one of the things. Uh, I obsessed with, especially because her grandson was also obsessed with this question, because it wasn't so clear. It was clear that she didn't tell them, but this is a very odd part of the story, where the Americans come in, uh, five soldiers, they quarter the house, and three of them have, one of them has a medusa, like this mini medusa, like a, not for on your door, but on the, as like a, like a yeah, thing, as a necklace. <laughs> Two others have the Star of David. So she's like, she's had lied all these times. She's always afraid that somebody would find out that she's Jewish. And now there are three Jewish soldiers in her house, but they have to sit in the cellar because they, she's Nazi with Nazis, right? She's German with his family. And then there's this, and it's very odd if it's all exactly true, if it really has happened as is in her memory. memory. Because I met, and this is all in the book, one of the German, uh, the grandson of these Germans that you saw in the picture. So, and she was a babysit for the grandson. So he still remembered her. I was so happy with that because a colleague at my newspaper once said, when I couldn't find anything in Poland, I said, he said, well, you know, one thing for sure of this whole story, because I told, I was very excited about the story, I told the whole story. You know that your lady is a proved liar. So yes, I know that. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't sure. 
what is true of the story, what is not. And this part is so spectacular. Part I'm going to tell you now about this uh, American soldiers. I wasn't so sure about this. So I had to find uh, descendants of these American soldiers. It was quite complicated. But so she's in the cellar, and apparently the soldiers are looking for her. That is a vague part of it. Well, you better read it good. But then she decides, and she tells the Germans, no, I'm not going to hide. I'm going upstairs. I'm going to handle this. But what she's thinking is that I'm going to tell them I'm a Jewish refugee from Poland. So she does. And then to her astonishment, the American soldiers say, yeah, right. Back to the cellar. <laughs> and, and, and that is heartbreaking for her, right? So she goes back to the Germans who are very friendly to her. She's like, oh, it's so horrible. What happened to you? What are you thinking the worst? And then she decides, I think a day later, it's in a book. I don't know exactly. It's like, no, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to do this. And I have, I have a better story to tell. So she goes back to the American soldiers, says again, I'm Jewish. Now, first she sings Judas Yiddish songs yes. while doing the dishes, right? Yes, yeah, so it's all wild now. And she already sees his soul is looking, what is with this girl? I mean, she's blonde, blue eyed, and she's singing Yiddish songs with us. That's a bit odd. Um, and there's a bit of tension in the air. Well, the, to make the story a bit shorter, it ends up with them getting a Torah or getting, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, she has to recite um, uh, prayers, <laughs> right? Uh, in Hebrew, and she does this, of course, perfectly. And in her story, the soldiers, it is as if they saw uh, water burning. Like it was like, and they were all extremely excited. They had this feeling, okay, they, they are at the point, you have to realize, it's 1945, April 1945. They start to see how bad it is. That, because many of the American soldiers, there were a lot of Jewish soldiers in the American army, lots of them, uh, the exact number is in the book, it's astonishing. And lots of them thought, what we read in the uh, army press is propaganda from our side. So why would we really believe it? it? It's probably not that bad as they say. But then they realize it's much worse. And they realize uh, well, their families or their descendants are, is everybody's wiped out, right? everybody's murdered. Right? So then they have this one girl they saved. That's how they feel it. So they put her on a tank and pick, make pictures of her. And they want to give her a letter so she can go to America right away. But that's hard for her. She also feels loyal to these German people. But she doesn't dare to tell them I'm Jewish. It's not like, hey, you were saying all these anti-Semitic things because they were. I'm one of them. Because now uh, there's an American expression. This verse, the coins is reversed. Uh, the, tables the, tables are the tables are turned. She doesn't have this. Um, I asked her many times. She didn't have this feeling. She was more confused. And she didn't dare to tell them. But she knew, I want to go back to Poland and find my family. And she did. But she never told them. But then there's this other story that's not in the book, but the grandson is really adamant about it, that her husband, the man she meets later, is a staunch atheist and a, a truth teller. And he doesn't like this. And when they're in Germany, in this internment place, this place waiting to go to Israel, they apparently go to this family, because he wants to, to tell them, tables are turned. And you know this girl that you love so much, and you think is a daughter of yours, or you behave as a daughter, because she had to say muti to this German woman, or had to, she hoped that she would say muti, and in the end she does. And apparently they went there, but I can't verify this, I cannot do it, but apparently they went there, sitting on the kitchen table, waiting for the parents to come home, and they weren't there. And apparently she, and she's a very dominant woman, or was a very dominant woman, convinced her husband to go. They're not here. Let's go. What are we doing here? You know, we're sitting here. And he was very, also quite dominant. So there must have been some very strong language. And then they decided to leave. So no, he never told these two people, Emma, uh, these people, the, the Mullers uh, from Zerbst, who became communists after this event, that uh, she was um, uh, a Jewish refugee from Poland. But uh, yeah, that, that's a big thing in the book. Uh, who did she tell? Why did she tell? Um, I read the I book. Congratulations, it's fantastic. And for those of you who haven't read it, you should definitely read it. Okay. Um, it's an amazing story and, and very relevant today. Um, I was curious about her love affair with the German boy, yeah. Eric. Yeah. Um, and uh, whatever happened, uh, and, and you think this is all true, or did she make up yeah. some fantasy person? Um, yeah. later on in life? Good, good question. 
Uh, I did find the man in papers, so in the administration, but I was very, I was shocked to find out that he was much older than what she described to me. And uh, well, when I confronted her with that, she said, I never said how old he was. Yeah, he was an older man, you know, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> I said he had a little hat, like this German hat, this, uh, of somebody who's a hunter, right? This green hat with a feather. And uh, did he? He said, well, I couldn't find that in the papers. He yeah, had a hat with a feather. We had this kind of conversation. But I think she was a bit ashamed of the fact that he was such an older man. Um, um, she, she also said he was very handsome, so he looked a bit younger than his age. Um, I'm pretty sure he existed from everything she told me about the trips they made and um, also the way he courted her uh, was difficult for her to give in to this man because he had a little sign of the Nazi party, the NSDAP on his. On the other hand, he was saying things like, uh, it's all rubbish, Hitler's going to lose, uh, it's all baloney, uh, I don't believe in it. Um, she was happy, of course, he did that because this guy was not doing that, you know, not at all. Um, yeah, this man, but it's in the book, and it's not answer to your question. And you read the book, so you know this. Maybe you allow me to tell me the story of they go to the cinema, and they and she's really struck by the anti-Semitic little film ahead of the main movie Heimkeer, which is a movie that was forbidden after the war. And once they walk back, she feels, as she said, she felt dirty. She felt like I betray my people. These are her words. I betray my people with them, and the nicer they do, the worse it feels. So she asked him, uh, the Jews in that movie, are they really that bad? And are Jews that bad? That's what she asked. And then he's saying, oh, girl, you don't want to know. It's much worse. You really you don't want to know. They lie, they cheat, they, they're the most uh, horrendous type of people. And then she asked him, uh, but did you ever meet one? Uh, and we have to reckon that in Germany, before the Second World War, less than 1% of the German population were Jewish. In Poland, it's a very different story. Uh, um, in Poland, you could not meet somebody uh, who would say, I never met a Jewish person. That would be very awkward. Uh, but he said, oh, no. Uh, so, so she asked, did you ever meet one? And then she, he's very dismissive. Oh, no, no, no happily not. No, no, of course not. It's a bit different than what I say now. Eh? It's like, did you meet everyone? And, uh, you know what you want? Yeah, happily not. Like, gelukkig niet. Yeah, no, uh, um, and in some way that consoles her, because then she realizes oh, the man is just completely ignorant. You know, um, so the, the, the first answer was horrible to her. The second question, kind of like, okay, then I can live with this because the man, you know. Was, yeah. That's not the answer to your question? Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm Natanya. Um, I was wondering, through your time interviewing people currently in Poland and living near the concentration camp areas, yeah. if you were able to get a sense of how they feel about the Holocaust, like currently today, or what their approach is, because um, you know a lot of tourists come to Poland. I myself went to Poland, yeah. and they must see people coming all the time to visit, you know, what had happened. And I'm wondering if you have a sense of how Polish people today feel about the whole thing. Yeah, that is a very complicated uh, mm -hmm. question. Um, if you're in Israel in high school, you go on an organized trip, like in Holland you go to Rome with the gymnasium, in Israel you go to, um, and I, I'm a bit afraid <coughs> to talk about this because I'm sure that people in the audience will know so much more about this than I do. But you sometimes see, they're 16 years old, they go with big Israeli flags and uh, big groups, um, and of course this arouses all different kind of sentiments among Poles. And there is a very awkward thing. Poland is quite a polarized society. It's weird to say that in America, we're an extreme polarized society nowadays. Holland is not so polarized, so it's more stunning for us to see. But there is an enormous interest in Poland in, for example, Yiddish studies. A lot of Poles study Yiddish now. Um, I met for an article I wrote about the reappearance of the Jewish community in Poland. This is like tiny, eh? I don't, don't think about it too big, but it's, uh, in percentage-wise, it's huge because going from nothing to something, right? Is like um, so. The Yiddish, the Jewish community in Krakow, in Krakow, Krakow, Krakow mm -hmm. yeah, um, is 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 quite lively. And uh, I spoke to a man who immigrated to Poland from Israel, 
And he told me how he got to Poland the first time. He said, well, there's a scholarship at my university. Uh, you can get a, a, three students every year can study in Poland and three Poles can study in Israel. The Pol Polish applications, there are like 400 uh, applicants every scholarship for every position and only one gets it. So 1200 for three places. The Israel scholarship to Poland, they back students. Like, let's fill those positions. Yeah. <laughs> At least can one person go to Poland. And we have a very good friend, my wife and I from Israel, living in Israel, who was an expat in Poland. And her grandmother was really asking her future, are you really sure you want to go to Poland? I mean, don't do it, right? It's the biggest Jewish graveyard in the world. Well, you probably know the ideas about Poland and Israel, and understandably so, right? why those ideas exist. Um, but we have to acknowledge that there is a big, pol that, that there is a huge interest in Poland now, in the life in Israel, in uh, the past, especially the Jewish past in Poland. But we have to be honest that the nationalistic parties, um, happily, they didn't really win the election this time. Some people say they lost the election, so that's hard. They're still the biggest party. But um, there was a, when I was in Poland, there was a secretary um, of education who denied the existence of the pogrom of Kielce in 1946, which is a very well documented pogrom. There were even people who were sent to prison during uh, that time. I mean, the communists really realized at that time we cannot let this go too far. Um, so it's a very well documented problem, very different from other ones. And to have somebody in the 21st century deny the existence, it's, it's quite disturbing. So uh, Poland isn't there yet. And um, there's a lot of current anti Semitism in Poland, which is a bit odd because it's like anti Semitism without Jews. It's the title of a book by an American scholar, anti Semitism without Jews, which is a bit odd, but it exists. And there's even one, when I once uh, pondered about it and asked somebody about it. Well, it's so weird. How can this be? Because in Holland, if you have like fights on the internet, these horrible fights below articles, my newspaper shut them down. But in the past, you could like write anything you wanted in the articles, right? After a while, they always end up uh, that people would say the other one is using a Godwin, that we would use the Second World War as like a moral uh, stick. Right. But in Poland, it always ends up, that's what a Pole told me, I don't know, in people accusing them each other of being Jewish. And then this guy told me, he said, well, you could find it very odd and ridiculous and stupid, but maybe there's some truth in it. <laughs> I mean, the Jewish community in Poland was so huge that there are a lot of people in Poland who are very interested in their background and who find out yes. on the deathbed of their grandmother, for example, that she was raised Jewish and that she didn't that she just didn't want to know about this after the Second World War for for very understandable reasons. But on their deathbed, they want to tell their grandchildren. Uh, maybe you made anti-Semitic jokes. I, I am a Jewish person or I was raised Jewish, right? I mean, how long do you etc. So the rabbi of Warsaw, uh, he's an American called Schutrich. He even has a little class and he calls calls them ex-sleepers, because he said there are a lot of sleepers, sleeper cells in this country. There are people who are actually Jewish, but still have to hear about it. And some of them hear this from their grandmother and want to do something with it. And, uh, and he lets them in, right? He gives them some education, some course. What does it mean? And what is it to be Jewish? And what was it to be Jewish? And uh, etc. So um, it's a subject that's very much alive. But these classes, these Jewish, uh, these classes from Israel, are a bit controversial. To, uh, we could talk about it later more, but that's. Um... I see we have two more hands, and then yeah. we'll we'll take these two questions. So, uh, as the child of somebody who lived in plain sight and survived the war because of it, um, I'm finding myself really struggling with the term you've used several times to describe her, which is she's a liar. Yeah. And yeah. um, I'm wondering if you could drill down a little bit. Yes. When you people are using it to you, what does it feel like to you? Yeah. What is it, you know, because yeah. it's such a complicated term. It's survival. Yeah. It's a resilient technique. Yeah. And those who didn't, six million people who didn't lie are dead. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what does it mean in this context yeah. from a, it's used almost 
when people say yeah. this to you in a moral context. Yeah. But it's got a complicated morality yeah. to it. So could you? Well, you're completely right. And I apologize. I should have like found an English word that sounds a bit different because I really think it's also because of translation that in Dutch it doesn't sound that harsh. But but you're absolutely right, and I shouldn't say it, and I, I take it back. Uh, it's more something for me to ponder on that I think the best thing any survivor could have done is not well. I have no opinion about this. Let's say that I have an opinion, but that doesn't really care matter. I, if you read the book, and it's a very much a pity that this man is not in the English index. It's a problem. Uh, our problem is a mistake. Uh, there is a rabbi, the rabbi of Kaunas, and he survived for a long time, so very far into the war. And people in horrible circumstances in the ghetto of Kaunas in uh, uh, Lat uh, uh, Lithuania, well, at that time, Polish occupied Poland by the Germans, people come to him with questions. Um, do we still st have to stick to this and this rule when it's completely impossible? Um, I mean, horrible, I, almost, I don't even dare to tell. I have one in my head now, I don't dare to tell now. It's in the book. But one of them is, can I take um, uh, a fake baptized document to survive? And he struggles with this. This is an orthodox uh, rabbi. Um, and I looked this up and I put it in the book because, of course, uh, my main protagonist struggled with this and struggled with this uh, years afterwards. Um, uh, and, and then I won't use the word lie. I mean, what, what can you do to survive, right? What can you say? How true, true do you have to stay to yourself? And I, I like, so I hope you could, he's not an index, but it's pretty fun. It's an epilogue. It's pretty sure he's an epilogue. So you can look it up. Uh, it's a very interesting man also, also and this rabbi said no you cannot do it you should stick to uh, what you are and we're jewish and he was quite lenient in other aspects and like not sticking to certain rules that were important for him um, to be uh, orthodox or to be a hasidic jew um, but for this one he was quite adamant at the same time he had this wonderful story of a man he, I, I describe him in the book uh, and I think he is in the index, and maybe you read it more recently than I do. Uh, it's a German, he came from Germany, he went to Poland, and he could pass as an ethnic German, just like uh, the main protagonist of my book. His story is actually even more spectacular because he was a man or a boy. And of course, if you, what Polish people did, or Ukrainians or Germans in that area, they didn't do this in Germany, but a very primitive way of seeing if somebody was Jewish, they take, pull down their pants. Um, with boys you could do that and he survived and he even went to a very elite institute of the Jugend, uh, the Hitler Jugend because some army high up uh, officer of the German army uh, was very fond of him and uh, sent him back from the East Front to Germany he, I think he legally even adopted him as a child um, and when he came out of the war well he ended up in Israel and he wrote his story in a German, it's, he wrote it in German, uh, Hitler Jungen Salomon. His name is Solomon Perel. And there's even a movie made about his life, Year of Year. The movie's a bit awkward because it's almost made as a comedy. Right? You saw it, it's, uh, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, it's weird, but I like the movie, but I can understand that some people don't like the movie. It's a strange movie. It, it won, I don't think it won an Oscar, but it won a big prize, an international. Yeah. And Jessica Holland, the director, I think, got a major award. Even yeah. Or something. Yeah. And that's his story. Um, and he uh, is very much from the other side. And he said it was ridiculous for people now to ask of me to, to not, uh, the word lie is not very friendly, to not bend the truth to survive. And of course I said I was, uh, hit, uh, I was an ethnic German because I knew I, you know, I, I tried something and it worked. But this story is so fascinating because he really goes into, uh, it's also in the movie, I think, in who is he? Because he really goes, he's so young that his new role as a young um, Hitler Jugend boy, who is even very good in the class of race theory, he like gives a lecture on race theory, on why Jews are inferior, etc. He knows that this is insane, this is ridiculous, but he also enjoys the success he has in his new world. So he says, you as he was called in German, that was his German, is still inside of me.
And he was saying this when he was deep in his 90s in Israel. He said, I'm Solomon, I'm Solomon for all this youth is also inside of me. So he's very much from the other side of this rabbi. But uh, I co completely agree with you. This is a big issue that I shouldn't like sweep away as something like, this is somebody who tells things, untruths all the time. But as a journalist, it was, it was complicated for me to know that, yes, he's good at telling stories, right? Uh, what can I believe? Because uh, I try to verify in present day life stories that are so old. And I remember that in the first draft, somebody read the first draft and said, you are a little bit too often complaining about her saying things that are not completely true. <laughs> That's not very sympathetic. This is different from what you said, but it reminds me of that. And I realized that this is true. So I took out quite a lot of uh, pages where I was basically complaining that what I found was a bit different than what she said. Like, hey, what can you expect? You know, why, why would you? That's your problem, Peter Van Oss. That's not her problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it is true about memory yeah. and how important, you know, our, our memories do change yeah. and and distort yeah. truth at time but it's very much the truth yeah from the perspective of the narrative exactly there's a the motto narrator. in the book by a dutch psychologist called dawe dreisma he's certainly translated in english and dawe dreisma said the uh, memory changes uh, while we're talking about it or it is better than i say now but that's one of the how does your memory change also by talking about it in the story changes, right? Um, and the story becomes truer than what you remember before you told the story. It's called, the chapter is called the Amstel. It's the only river in Holland in the book, because that's about me, or that's about her talking to me. And it doesn't take much to change your memories. Talking about, <coughs> talking about them is often enough. It's probably true. Um, but thank you for your uh, the question. Maybe final question? No, it, it, it's been a, a and, so that everyone can hear you. We all were through it with respect to Austria and Poland is only happened later, but it's the same thing that for the European countries, for a lot of economic, political co uh, cohesiveness issues, that whether you were a victim or whether you were the war criminal is a very, very important historical uh, item for, again, Austria for many decades of the Kreisky and the rest of it. But for Poland, it came out with the law. And I thought that that happened while you were in Poland. Yeah, sure. And the fight with Israel and the fight yeah. about the historical narrative, yeah. I thought was the reason why you put that in, because the reality is that the great irony of the Holocaust that nobody talks about is that the only Jews that survived were the ones who actually fled with the Soviet army. Everybody yeah. in the West, with yeah. a few very small exceptions, yeah. were wiped out. Like this one exception. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. This few exceptions. Exactly. And, and so it's uh, yeah. it, this port, and of course, afterwards, the Polish exterminated whatever people came back or survived over the next three programs over 30 years at different yeah. times in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yeah. And so I was wondering how, if that also played in to your. Um, description of reality because yeah. Poland is such a complicated yeah. uh, history. It doesn't fall into any good guys and bad guys, victims and aggressors, but it is a much more yeah. uh, real and complicated story. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, so the story in the beginning of the book was also about this, but there were so many reasons and, and then part of my English, so I, I need so many words to say just a few things. Um, this is, uh, thank you for putting this so eloquently, that's part of it. Actually, I hoped, and this sounds bad, but this is how writers are, right? There's a Polish translation. I even hoped that some nationalistic Poles would point towards this law and say, this book should be forbidden, and this guy, we should start a law case against him. Because it's officially forbidden, forbidden in Poland now to, and I should word this correctly, because that's always the thing, right? When you, you cannot say that the Polish nation was complicit in the Holocaust. It's very strange to claim that because there was no Polish nation at that time, but Poles were complicit, many Poles were complicit. And the first story, you immediately read about that. So I hope some people will get angry, but then I realized and some Polish friends told me a bit laughingly, like, no, Peter, don't think too much of yourself. This, is, this law is for people who already know. This is mainly for a few Jewish American scholars came from Poland. Um, Grabowski is one famous <coughs> Grabowski. Grabowski. Um, and we they wanted to scare them with this law. Uh, if you come to Poland, we're going to arrest you. 
And um, there was one law case even, not against Jan Dobrowski, you know. Uh, but this is not for Peter van Os from Holland that nobody cares about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a bit disappointing. <laughs> but yeah, that, that is part of the equation. Absolutely, it is part of the story that uh, these are such a strange laws about uh, historical truth, that there could be laws about what we can say about the past and what we cannot say about the past. It's absolutely mind boggling. Thanks for mentioning that. Sorry, that was it. Oh, that was the last question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, um, that's okay. I can speak now. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Peter and Jocelyn, for this incredible thank conversation. You. I think it's quite rare that we are able to have opportunities to get to speak directly with an author about such an incredible book, about such an incredible story. So we're really, really grateful that you could fly all the way over the pond uh, and come and talk to all of us. Um, so Peter is going to actually be signing books, and you can ask even more questions if you like yeah, <laughs> outside right. here at the table where you checked in. We also have a lovely reception in the back. Please help yourself to beverages, drinks, uh, as well as any food that you like. Um, we have the room until about 7.30 or so, so please mingle and, and enjoy yourselves. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.